good to see all of you. Great to uh, have you. It's great to see you in person gathering. Let me say a word of welcome to those who are also uh, joining us uh, virtually online. We're super glad you guys are tuning in with us and those who might be listening out on the patio uh, during our morning patio viewing gatherings. If you are in that space, we are grateful that you are tuning in as well. I'm preaching in a t-shirt today. It's my first time ever. And the reason is, is because I'm promoting HSM Serve, high school ministry doing a, a new thing where instead of gathering to have more content, more Bible content shoved into their brains, they are dispersing throughout our church family on Sunday mornings, serving in all sorts of various ways and, and wanting to give back instead of take in more. That's a good thing, right? So HSM Serve, they had shirts like this. Toby's back there. Toby's an HSM server. He's in the sound booth. So if you see them, they wear the, usually wear a shirt looks just like this. So make sure you say hi to them and thanks for serving and all of that. They are integrating into our church family and our church serve in a really healthy way. So just wanted to promote that a little bit. So I'm thinking that every ministry needs to have their own shirt so then each week I can... <laughs> Maybe not. Hey, uh, let me cue you guys up, too. Uh, if you don't have one of your communion cups, make sure you get one of those. And if you're like me, you got to put your glasses on, and you got to separate that clear part from the foil part ahead of time. I have to do that ahead of time because uh, I had a bad experience the first time around. And um, you get your juice before you get your wafer, and usually the juice is all over your lap, and it's a mess. So um, I usually just prime the wrapper a little bit, okay? Awesome. Uh, today, we are taking another step in our series, Timeless Truths, Timeless Truths. Um, in this series, uh, these, are, these are ancient truths that have a ton of relevance for today. And so, we are uh, going back, 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 back and looking at some of this very ancient truth. And uh, we're bringing it in and say, how does it apply to how we live today? Each week we've been setting down in one of the minor prophets. Remember, uh, these, are, these prophets are minor. Not, this isn't like a baseball thing. It's not like the major league and the minor league. And these are the minors, so they're not as good as the major. It's not that. The, these, are, these are minor because they just wrote less, okay? They, their, their prophecies were shorter, so that's why they've come to be known as a minor. So we've been stepping down in, in one of those each week throughout this series, and today we're going to step into the book of Zechariah. So if you, you, you may have never turned to the prophet Zechariah, and that's okay, but uh, find your way there, look in the table of contents if you need to, whatever, find your way there to Zechariah. Zechariah's prophetic ministry occurred very close to Haggai's, which we looked at last week. It was, uh, this, in terms of the, the history of Israel, this was in the time that was er, early in the reign of King Darius in Persia. And uh, when he came to power, as Roy reminded us last week, he gave permission for the, the Jews to return. And uh, to re he resourced them to rebuild the town, city of Jerusalem, to rebuild the temple, all that. And remember last week, Haggai's message was, you guys got to get to it. Because they were dragging their feet and they were building their own homes. They were investing in, in rebuilding their own homes and their own lives and they were neglecting the temple. And so Haggai had to kind of give them a little swift, you know, in the wear. So uh, to make that happen. This week, um, now the fir these first wave of exiles had been back for almost 16 years. And the work on the temple was just now starting. And so now Zechariah was fine. Now Zechariah's ministry basically kicked into gear. And Zechariah basically now says, um, let me remind you of all of God's faithfulness and all of his promises as you walk in obedience to him. Let me remind you what's coming when, when you follow God's call and do what he calls you to do. So Zechariah basically in his uh, prophecy is reminding God's people of God's faithfulness. He's, remind, he's reassuring God's people of God's promises, and he's reassuring them that God is going to empower them and work through them to, to restore Jerusalem, to restore the temple, restore their land, and he's going to enable them to rebuild the temple better than its former glory. 
And he reassures them in the end that God's going to bring his ultimate restoration to their lives, their ultimate spiritual restoration to their lives in the new heaven and the new earth. You guys are going to be so glad you came to church today. This prophetic message from Zechariah is so encouraging. Now, before we jump into it, uh, it's worth uh, pointing out that the first half of Zechariah's book is very difficult to interpret. If you've ever spent time reading it, you might, uh, it might make you think you're reading the book of Revelation. The language and the imagery and the scenes and the visions are very much like Revelation in the first eight chapters. In fact, one scene, he reminds me of the Pilgrim's Progress. You guys read Pilgrim's Progress? If you have not, you must get a copy and start reading it this week. That's a classic, all right? Pilgrim's Progress. Remember where virtue and vice are personified, people with names, you know? So, so it's Christian, right? And it's evangelist and help, and they're on a journey, right? And then there's also worldly wise, obstinate, and shame. So there's virtue and vice throughout that. Well, Zechariah reads like that in the first eight chapters. In chapter 5, Zechariah sees a woman in a basket, <laughs> This is, this is how crazy these visions are. He sees a woman in the basket, and her name is Wickedness, and she's trying to get out. And he slams the lid on her, and then they, this uh, angel carries her off into a faraway land, like gets her out of the, you know, imagery of getting wickedness away from Israel. Isn't that awesome? So, I mean, it's like, it's like that. So, so uh, at times, Zechariah's prophecy um, it, 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 even though there's in these kind of peculiar visions, often there's an angel that shows up and interprets, and you're like, thank you, right? And then, that, but then there's other times where you're like, okay, where's the angel? I need some help here, and there isn't anything. So it's a very interesting read. Now, I always like to try to help you understand how uh, a book like Zechariah is set apart from the other prophets. Because this is the 11th of 12 minor prophets we've been in over the, during this series. And uh, it may start to all feel like it's running together a little bit for you. So let's, let's talk about a few things that set Zechariah apart. And I hope, hope that maybe these will stick in your frontal lobes. Zechariah's prophecy is, uh, he's actually the most prolific of the minor prophet writers. So he's the He's the least minor of the minors. <laughs> He's almost a major. Uh, his, his prophecy is the longest of any of them. Now, here's, the, here's your only quiz today. We're not going to go through all of the books and the key words. Here's your only quiz. What was the other prophet who was the shortest or the most minor of the prophets? Obadiah. Yes. Yes, Obadiah. Bing, 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 bing. Give her a prize. Extra communion cup. <laughs> Yeah, Obadiah, shortest, Zechariah, longest, all right? Got that? Who was the shortest? Longest? Yeah. Last part of this book, chapters 9 through 11, is, uh, is second only to the prophet Ezekiel and the most quoted in the Gospels. So if, you, if that ever comes up in a trivial pursuit game, you guys got it, okay? So the most quoted uh, in the Gospels the book of Zechariah. Isn't that interesting? The prophet Zechariah, the most quoted in the Gospels. And most notably, it's Zechariah who is quoted, you know when? When Jesus rides into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday, right? And he is heralded as king of the Jews. He says, see, your king comes to you righteous and victorious, lowly and riding on the donkey on a coat full of donkey. That's Zechariah. Yay? See, now you can put some pieces together. And then, as he's preparing to go to the cross, Jesus uses Zechariah's prophecy when he said, strike the shepherd and the sheep will scatter. Remember that? So, again, Zechariah's prophecy often used in the Gospels. The last half of Zechariah's prophecy, and we're only going to touch on it today, is the description of what it will be like when life is finally, completely restored to a sin-free experience in the new heaven and the new earth. So stick with me today till we get to the end because the best is yet to come, friends, <laughs> all right? 
Now, in these days, we are all craving some good news. I'm having conversations with people all over. Uh, they are dying for some good news, some encouraging news, some news that is full of hope. And so I'm glad you came today, and I'm glad Zechariah shared his ministry. So I want to take you to chapter 3. So if you're in Zechariah, go to chapter 3. I want us to look at one of these very graphic visions that he has, and I want to look at this because it's specifically relevant for us today, and I, bl I believe will lift your heart. All right, so let's, let's uh, start with chapter 3, verse 1. Then he showed me Joshua, the high priest, standing before the angel of the Lord, and Satan standing at his right side to accuse him. Now, let's pause there for a second. Let's get a grip on the characters in the scene, okay? So he, who does he refer to? He refers to God, God Almighty, Jehovah, okay? You might just write in your notes there. He refers to God. Joshua, the high priest, in this vision, as priests do, represents God's people, Makes sense, right? So he, that is God, he's, and then Joshua is the high priest. He's representing the sinful people of God. And then who else do we have in this, this piece of the, the opening piece of this? The angel of the Lord. See that? Now, the angel of the Lord is often understood to be a pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus. A pre-incarnate manifestation of Jesus. Uh, or at least a, a messenger or close representative of Jesus, okay? So keep that in mind. Satan, of course, is the chief of the evil priest. Now, notice in, in this opening verse, he's at Joshua's right side. See that? He's at Joshua's right side, the typical position of the prosecutor in, uh, or the accuser in a court. And he's standing there highlighting all of Joshua's weaknesses and faults. Okay? Now, that's Satan's favorite thing to do. You, know, you realize that? That's his favorite thing to do. He wakes up every morning. He goes to bed every night. I don't know. He, he probably doesn't sleep. I don't know. But that's his favorite thing to do. And, and, and he's doing it here in Joshua's life. And it's his favorite thing to do in your life. To dwell on our sins, highlight our weaknesses, argue for why you should be condemned, why you should be damned. His favorite tool is what you could call neurotic or unhealthy guilt. His favorite mechanism is your negative self-talk. You, you all know it. <laughs> you know it when it kicks in. You, you start getting down on yourself. That's the enemy's favorite tool. And his goal is to convince you that you are unworthy and that you are undeserving of anything good that God would want to give to you. Or has done for you. So that's what he's trying to do here in this scene. And that's exactly what he does in your life and my life. Now, let's listen in on verse 2. Let's listen in on God's response to all of this accusing. Okay? This is so awesome. Look at verse 2. The Lord said to Satan, The Lord rebuke you, Satan. The Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is not this man a burning stick snatched from the fire? Let's pause again. <laughs> Notice, twice, God indignantly and emphatically shouts him down, rebukes him. So instead of damaging others or damaging Joshua with his fault finding, Satan, uh, Satan actually secures his own reprimand from God. Yay? 
I don't, can't tell if you're smiling behind your mask, some of you. Yeah, he, Satan accuse, he secures his own reverence. God, God's repeated rebuke, his, his repeated rebuke indicates that Satan has completely, listen, failed to make his case against Joshua. In other words, and Joshua represents who? So he's failed to make his case against the people of God. God simply ignores his accusations. Please hear that. You're the only one paying attention to them, your own self-talk. God's not paying attention to that. Do you, do you hear that? International sign of yes. Yeah. Do you hear? Yeah. He, he, God's not hearing it. He, he ignores the accusations and instead turns it back on Satan. I love that. Notice, too, God refers to Joshua, who's the representative of, of, of sinful people, as a burning stick snatched from the fire. Isn't that interesting? For the, for the people of God in, in these days, uh, this referred to being uh, snatched from the judgment fires of exile, okay? Snatched from the judgment fires of exile in Babylon and allowed to return to Jerusalem. The point is, God is making, God has rescued them. God has rescued them for preservation, not for destruction. He's going to pull them out of Babylon, pull them out of exile, and then judge them again. Hello? Having snatched the brand from the flames, he's not about to throw it back in the fire. It reminds me, you guys, will, you guys will resonate with this, it reminds me of an old gospel song by the Imperials. Remember the Imperials? Russ Taff, oh, the guy was butter, wasn't he? Oh, my word. He, he, they sang this song, and here's how the chorus went. He didn't bring us this far to leave us. He didn't teach us to swim to let us drown. He didn't build his home in us to move away. He didn't lift us up to let us down. Isn't that good? It, I, I, I want you to see something significant here. Satan fails to successfully prosecute us not because of any righteous works we have done. God does not say, a rebuke saying, because of Joshua's holiness and his perfection and his faithfulness. He rebukes Satan on the basis of, I have chosen Jerusalem. See, Satan fails because God chooses to save us from bondage to sin. Do you hear that? That's, that's incredible news. Guys, please realize, in the face of accusations, God chooses you. In the, in the face of your negative, self-condemning, self-talk, please know God's not hearing it. He's choosing you. He chose you. I want that to sink in. I mean, does Satan have plenty of accusations he could make about you? Well, I, I mean... I think about that for myself. I'm like, lots of material. Absolutely. I mean, every day of the week, plenty of material. I mean, we're all, I think, smelling a little smoky. You know what I mean? We've all been snatched from the fires of judgment. We've all been spared like a firebrand from the fire. Not to just toss back in. No. No. Notice, can any of, of his accusations stick in this scene? Can he change God's posture towards us by pointing out all of our flaws? No, it doesn't work. 
because Jesus is standing there the whole time. Remember the angel of the Lord? He's standing right there. He's standing right there the whole time saying, yep, no, I know about that. Yep, know about that. Yep, I'm aware. This guy's a loser. Yep. She's unfaithful. Yep. That person's feral life is feeble. Yep. I know all about it. And I have chosen to love them and save them. He's not saying he's perfectly worthy, so I'm, I'm saving him. God says, I love him. I'm choosing him. I rebuke you, Satan. The Apostle Paul reinforces this truth in Titus, just so you know, it's just not so ancient, it doesn't matter anymore. In the New Testament, I love it, Paul says this in Titus 3, at one time we too were foolish, disobedient, deceived, and enslaved by all kinds of passions and pleasures. We lived in malice and envy, being hated and hating one another. But when the kindness and love of God, our Savior, appeared, he saved us not because of righteous things we had done, but because of his mercy. (laughs) Oh, gosh. You guys, it doesn't get better than that. So having chosen us, notice what happens next. Look at verse 3. Now, Joshua was dressed in filthy clothes as he stood before the angel. The angel said to those who were standing before him, take off his filthy clothes. Then he said to Joshua, see, I have taken away your sin, and I will put fine garments on you. Then I said, put a clean turban on his head. So they put a clean turban on his head and clothed him while the angel of the Lord stood by. Oh, my gosh. In Hebrew usage, garments represented sin, and removing his filthy clothes is said to symbolize removing of sin and its consequences from Joshua. He now stands justified just as if I'd never sinned. And it's worth noting the phrase, taking off his filthy clothes, is a, is a Hebrew expression that is akin uh, to the word picture of repentance, turning away from, uh, or withdrawing from. So there's a forgiveness, uh, a clear forgiveness piece in this, but it's coupled with a clear transformation or freedom piece that enables us to be free from bondage and and to be free from uh, still being tripped up by the same old sin. And in addition, this clean headdress speaks of the symbol of holiness and purity. I love the way Paul says it in Romans. He says, says, when you place your faith in Jesus, he wraps you in his righteousness. So when God sees you, he sees the righteousness of Jesus. I love that. And notice in this scene, this all occurred while who was standing by? Look at your text. Who was standing by? What does it say at the end? Yeah, yeah, the, the, the text says the angel of the Lord stood by. Remember who that was? Likely refers to Christ or a close representative of Christ. Picture it. He, he continues standing by like a, like a master presiding over the ceremony, approving and adorning, giving his affirmation, his presence. So Joshua's there, and Satan's there, accusing, 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 blah, blah, blah. The whole time, God's saying, yeah, I know about that. I know about that imperfection, and I've chosen to save, and I've chosen to forgive, and I've chosen to cleanse, and I've chosen to make the imperfect holy and pure once again. I've chosen. I've spared them from judgment, so therefore there is now no condemnation for those I've chosen. Are you hearing this? Okay. Guys, this scene is exactly what God promises for us if we'll come to him and surrender our hearts to him. If we'll admit that we're imperfect, if we'll own that we're sinners in need of judgment, or rather sinners in need, (laughs) who deserve judgment, but are in need of forgiveness, he'll do this for us. 
Maybe you're one who had walked close with Jesus earlier in your life, but now have drifted away. If, maybe you're one who has never, never recognized what it really means to come to Jesus and why it's so important. You just need to return to God. <laughs> in fact, Zechariah starts out his whole book with this invitation in chapter one. This is what the Lord Almighty says. Return to me, and I will return to you. See, it's that clean. It's not return to me and give an account, and then I'll run you through the spanking machine, and I'll give you judgment. Return to me, and I will return to you. The New Testament says it this way. Draw near to me and I will draw near to you. It's clean. It's pure. It's simple. Too many times people say, ah, oh, I, I hear what you're saying, and I hear what the Bible says, and I, I yeah, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, I gotta go get my act together so I can come back to God. Uh-uh. Return to me, and I will return to you. Isn't this an encouraging scene? It gets better. (laughs) Once sin is cleansed, and we are made holy, God gives some assurances. Look at verse 6 and 7. Then the angel of the Lord gave this charge. Okay, so so now here's a a charge coming. Here's a declaration. The angel of the Lord gave this charge to Joshua. This is what the Lord Almighty says. If you will walk in obedience to me and keep my requirements, then you will govern my house and have charge of my courts. And I will give you a place among those standing here. Let's let's pause. Once sin is cleansed, God gives us some assurances. The first one is you are given the assurance of a place in God's family and mission a place, a role in God's family and mission. See, when you come to God or when you return to him and you're daily trusting him, see, when, you, when you're following him and filling his requirements, means that you're trusting him daily. You're trusting in his uh, forgiveness and in his sacrifice on the cross for you. You're trusting in that and you're following him and you're learning to, 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 to live in love like him. And when you do, Jesus says, uh, th- or this text says, you become a part of his family and part of his mission. So that means he uses your unique personality. Some of you are super unique. And you might wonder, how do I fit in? Well, here it is. You have a place in God's mission, a unique personality. You have unique passions. You have unique gifting, unique education, unique experience in work and in life. And he uses you then, as you're following him, to spread and develop his influence in the world. This is a beautiful part about how how God spreads his influence in the world. He chooses to use, you know, gomers like us, right? He chooses to use us. Each of us is unique, and as we all travel in different circles, and some get to go to Alaska and spend six days fishing. I won't mention any names, but I'm jealous. You know, wherever we go and whatever we're doing, whether it's fun or work or pleasure, he's using our unique uh, 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 makeup As we intersect vastly different lives, you see, you will touch and reach and have the opportunity to touch and reach lives. I'll never have the opportunity to touch and reach. And as you lean into God and seek to live like him, he uses you in the lives of others. And he uses you to draw all sorts of different kinds of people to him. You were given a place in his family. You were given a place in his mission. You're God's kid. You're God's ambassador. Cool? Now, Zechariah gives an assurance of God's provision and protection. Look at verse 8. Listen, high priest Joshua, 
you and your associates seated before you who are men symbolic of things to come. Notice what he says. I'm going to bring my servant the branch. Does your Bible have that capitalized? Yep. The branch. See, verse 9. So he's going to bring the branch, and then verse 9, see the stone I have set in front of Joshua. There are seven eyes on that one stone. And I will engrave an inscription on it, says, says the Lord Almighty, and I will remove the sin of this land in a single day. Now we're, just talking to, now we're starting to sound like Revelation. Things with eyes on them and all that, right? First of all, this servant branch, please just realize that is a clear reference to who? The Messiah, Jesus, yeah, very clear. Uh, Zechariah uses that analogy, the branch. Uh, Isaiah, Jeremiah both use that, okay? And please, here's how you have to picture this. This isn't like a branch on a tree among many other branches, all similar coming out. This is a, this is a different word. This is a different word that, that talks about a shoot that comes out from the root and forms a whole other huge tree, see? Now, for those in Zechariah's audience, this promised Messiah is an assurance of God's ultimate provision for sin in the future, right? That's what they looked forward to the Messiah. It's an assurance of their future ultimate salvation and restoration as God's people. It's a hope and promise that they looked forward to. Make sense, right? But today, for us, it's different. We now anchor, we look back, and we anchor our faith in the historical person of Jesus, his crucifixion and his resurrection. So Zechariah's audience looked back, or looked forward, rather, to these events to strengthen their faith. And we look back to them to strengthen our faith. So that's the easy part of those verses. <laughs> now let's talk about rocks and eyeballs. Uh, there's a peculiar piece of the vision. It's, it's crazy sounding. Uh, this whole stone. Now, immediately, most people read this, like I did, and we picture a stone with seven eyes on it. Do we have that picture? Okay. So, that's like, that's like you know, I'm watching you, Wazowski. You know, it's like creepy, right? That's what we picture, though. But... Most interpreters believe it is best to understand this as a stone with seven pairs of eyes separate from the stone that are focused on that stone. Now, now, now stay with me here. So the stone is there, and there's eyes outside or apart or separate, seven pairs of eyes staring or folk trained on the stone. Is that, are you seeing that differently now? You see, does that make sense? Okay, most understand these seven pairs of eyes trained on this one stone to represent the fullness and the all-encompassing providence of God. Or the seven eyes of the Lamb which are sent out into all the earth, the seven-fold spirits that go out from him mentioned in Revelation. Let me, let me take you back there. I think we have this on the screen. Then I saw a lamb. Then I saw a lamb looking as if it had been slain. Do you guys remember this text from Revelation? Standing on the center of the, uh, center of the throne and circled by the four living creatures and the elders, the lamb had seven horns and, notice, seven eyes, which are, here, here it defines it, the seven spirits of God sent out into all the earth. The stone in this scene represents you, me, God's church, God's people. In other words, the fullness of God's protective overwatch is directly focused on you and me. I think this is a legit understanding because it aligns with what Zechariah writes in chapter 2, verse 8, when he said, whoever touches you touches the apple of his eye. You ever think, you think of yourself as that? The apple of God's eye? Do you? It's not, I didn't make it up. I'm reading the Bible. I'm just saying God is giving you the assurance of his provision and protection. 
Finally, you are given the assurance of eternity with God. Look at verse 10. In that day, each of you will invite your neighbor to sit under your vine and fig tree, declares the Lord Almighty. That's, that's a prophetic way of referring to the day when we finally enjoy a sin-free existence. A time of peace, time of tranquility, no more fighting, no more war, don't have to be on edge, no more efforting. You don't invite people to sit under your vine or your fig tree when, it, when there's turmoil. This is a time of peace. Once Satan and sin are dealt with forever, a time when we finally experience a kind of Garden of Eden restored, a sin-free, peace-filled fellowship with God and one another. Now, here's how it's revealed to John, the writer of Revelation. If you want to turn your Bibles, this is worthy. Turn your Bibles to Revelation 21. I, I, this is too long. I don't think I have this on a, on a slide. Revelation 21, I'll read it for you if you just want to soak it in. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth. For the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Look, God's dwelling place is now among the people, and he will dwell with them. This will, they, they will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain, for the old order of things have passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. Write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the spring of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit all of this, and I will be their God, and they will be my children. <laughs> Friends, all of these assurances can be yours. Assurance of salvation and restoration, assurance of God's, of a place in God's family and mission, assurance of God's provision and protection, assurance of eternity with him. Our key word for Zechariah, can you guess it? Assurances. That's what Zechariah's talking about. Do you have it? Do you have it? God has been clear. In his mercy and grace, he has chosen to move toward you with forgiveness to cleanse and restore. He has provided everything to make it possible. It now comes down to you. You've got to open your heart to him, to his provision. He has chosen you. Now you must choose him. Whether you're here in the gathering or listening online or, or where, is God, is God drawing you to himself? Can you sense it? It's right about now. When Satan starts giving you reasons why you don't deserve any of this. <laughs> it's right about now where that self-talk I was talking about. Remember, because he never stops. Like he, well, you know, you, <laughs> if, the, if the pastor knew your story, he wouldn't be saying that to you. <laughs> if, the, if the pastor knew what you think about 20 times a day, he, he wouldn't be saying that to you. You, you know? That's what, that's, what, that's what the enemy, enemy makes you start thinking, you, you don't really need this. 
The enemy, the, the enemy starts telling you, you know, you, he, he, his, his favorite song is to, to sing your pride song. You know, you, you really, you, you're above this. He's probably at work right now pointing out how unworthy you are. You might be thinking, I can't. I could never be a Christian. You know what? You're right. I can't. I, I could never follow through on that. I, I know me. I'm, I'm this. I'm that. That's what, that's what the enemy does. But you got to remember, you have to remember our story today. None of that nonsense matters. That's nonsense. God rebuked Satan twice for throwing it in Joshua's face. It's nonsense. God says, I'm choosing to forgive, to cleanse, and restore. All you have to do is return to me, and I'll return to you. Return to me. Draw near to me. I'll draw near to you. If, if, if that's what you know you need to do today, maybe you, maybe you want to pray something like this. I would put a prayer on the screen. God, Thank you for your promise and provision to forgive, to cleanse, to heal my life. Thank you for choosing to save me from the consequences of my sin. I want to choose you today as well. I want to begin to follow you and enjoy the assurances of salvation for your provision, your protection, eternity with you. If that is resonating in your heart today, please don't shut that down. Don't shut that down. Pray that. If you've prayed that prayer, please let me or Phil, wait, let one of us know. Let one of us know that. If you're listening online, I've, I've got a phone number there. Just, just text the word assurance to me. Just text that, text that word assurance. You don't even have to spell it right. <laughs> you know, just text that word assurance. 530-492-5330. It's the number on your screen. We'd love to pray with you. We'd love to keep the conversation going, encourage you to next steps in your journey with Jesus, who has chosen you to be his. In fact, a great next step uh, would be to celebrate communion like we're going to do right now. This is a great response for us, given the nature of this text today. I'm going to invite the worship team, actually, to come on back up and get situated. They're going to lead us in, in a response as a part of this. I pre-separated my clear wrap from my foil wrap, as I strongly encouraged you to do. <laughs> Communion is a perfect response to our Zechariah text today. It looks back to the events of the Messiah that were foretold in the prophets. We are told to look back to remember. They were told to look forward in faith. We were taught to look back in faith, to remember, to reflect, to cherish the work of Jesus on the cross that was our provision for sin, his life for our life. Many of you are aware that in the New Testament, when we watch and, and observe the life of Jesus, he was in his upper room, in the upper room rather, with his closest followers, and he took bread, and when he had given thanks for it, he broke it, and he gave it to them, and he said, this is my body, which is given for you. I choose you this day. Let's remember him as we eat together. In the same way, after supper, he took the cup. The text says, he took it and he said, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. I always like to point out that in the flow of the Passover meal, the cup that he grabbed was the cup of redemption. And he assigned new meaning to it. A meaning that said, I choose you, and I'm giving my life for you, and my blood will seal this covenant of grace and forgiveness. Let's remember him as we drink together.
Lord Jesus, it is, um, it is always stunning to me to see the, the thread of your saving plan all through the Old Testament right into the new and to the end. You never got distracted. You never were thrown off course. You never considered going with some other plan. You set your face towards Jerusalem. You set your face towards the cross. You set your heart toward us. So thank you. I want to pray for my friends in this room today who have those struggles and battles with that sense of guilt or unworthy, I'm not good enough, I'm this, I'm that, I'm, I just can't, I, I won't, I'm not able. Lord, I pray that your spirit would give each of us right in the smack middle of those moments where the enemy is trying to discourage us, that we would remember this scene. And we would remember your rebuke of Satan and your words of choice and choosing us. And that you've wrapped us in your righteousness and you've chosen to make us your holy people. Lord, thank you for that. We celebrate you. We, we worship you. Um, not just with our not just with our lips on a Sunday morning like this, but with our lives. And so hear our response and hear our hearts as we thank you in song.